So, uh, my name is Haji Bakara. I'm a uh, assistant professor in the English department, and it is my distinct honor to welcome Mark Philip Bradley to the University of Michigan on behalf of the Donia Center for Human Rights. Professor Bradley is not only an innovator and a leading scholar of human rights history, uh, but he's also a beloved teacher in the field and a mentor to countless undergraduates and graduate students at the University of Chicago, uh, including myself. Uh, so it's nice to see my own human rights students in the room uh, who I've told numerous times that I, I learned everything I know from, from Mark Bradley. <laughs> um, professor Bradley is the Bernadette E. Schmidt Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of History at the University of Chicago and the faculty director and kind of the spiritual leader of the Posen Center for Human Rights. Um, Professor Bradley's scholarly career began fittingly here at the University of Michigan where he received his BA in History and General Studies in 1986 and uh, a Master's in Asian Studies the following year. After leaving Michigan, he went on to do his graduate work in history at Harvard, where he studied, I think not insignificantly, under the direction of the path-breaking global historian Akira Ure. Since receiving his PhD in 1996, Bradley has been a leading member of a generation of historians who, has, who have significantly transformed and in some cases reinvented the fields of diplomatic, intellectual, transnational, global, and human rights history. Across those fields, Bradley's impact has been especially notable in two ways, I think. First has been his thorough decolonization of historical fields until very recently dominated by Western perspectives and Western archives, um, such as diplomatic, intellectual, and global history. Second has been his application of the methods and archives of media and cultural studies, literary criticism, and even affect theory to the study of international relations and diplomacy. Bradley's early efforts to decolonize and acculturate international history are on full display in his first two monographs on the history and legacy of the Vietnam War, Imagining Vietnam in America, The Making of Postcolonial Vietnam, published in 2000, Vietnam at War, published in 2009, as well as his co-edited collection with Marilyn Young, Making Sense of the Vietnam War's Transnational and International Perspectives, published in 2008. Meanwhile, Bradley has also co-edited two path-breaking collections of transnational cultural history. The first with Patrice Petro is Truth Claims, Representations, and Human Rights, published in 2002. And the second with Brooke L. Brower, Blower is The Familiar Made Strange, Iconic, Americans, uh, Iconic American Icons and Artifacts After the Transnational Turn, 2015 in Cornell. Uh, last year, Professor Bradley published a book that one reviewer rightly called a beautiful and luminous account of the global human rights movement, the world reimagined Americans, Americans and human rights in the 20th century. It's from this book that Professor Bradley will draw today in his talk, The United States and the Making of the 1970s Global Human Rights Imagination. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Philip Bradley. Thank you for such a nice introduction. You guys are so lucky that Haji is on your faculty and teaching you. He's um, somebody that I learned a tremendous amount from by being on his dissertation committee. And it's just nice to see him ensconced here and, and looking very happy. Um, you know, you come back to your undergraduate institution and you don't want to complain. So I'm not a complaining person. I, I don't want to like offer any complaint. But back in the day, we would give these talks and you could see everybody because they were in rows. <laughs> Now, the University of Chicago is not as innovative as clearly the Michigan campuses. We're still in rows. So this is a little new to me. I'm sorry, how far are people? I guess I can see you. So I'm just feeling a little badly that they want me here so that they can film me. Some of you are going to have a hard time seeing me, but we'll, we'll, we'll cope as we go. Um, I want to take you back to 1977. Um, to the inaugural address that Professor G or, uh, President Professor <laughs> President Jimmy Carter gave um, on becoming the president of the United States, Carter said, "Quote: The world is now dominated by a new spirit. Peoples more numerous and more politically aware are craving and now demanding their place in the sun. 
not just for the benefit of their own physical condition, but for basic human rights. In the wake of Carter's inaugural address, human rights increasingly became front and center in the popular consciousness of the United States, with as many as 67% of Americans saying in a May 1977 poll that they had read or heard a great deal or a fair amount about human rights. This afternoon, I want to think with you about how this new consciousness around human rights emerged in 1970s America, about its conditions of possibility and its limits, and also toward the end to think a little bit about how these historical legacies might help us understand human rights in the age of Trump. Now, Many American historians have followed the self-perceptions of Jimmy Carter and his contemporaries, arguing that Carter's inaugural address and his pioneering, if not always successful, human rights diplomacy propelled human rights, they say, to unprecedented heights of prestige and power. In their view, Carter's embrace of human rights and its broader popular resonance in the 1970s had their sources in a purely domestic U.S. context, and then gradually cascaded out into the world. As the causal motor in these American-based accounts, they point to the crisis of national confidence in the wake of Watergate and America's ignoble departure from Vietnam in 1973, and a more general revulsion at the real politique of Nixon and Kissinger's foreign policy. These, they say, are the crucial elements that produced human rights talk in the United States in the 1970s. Now, American assumptions about their own primacy in the making of a global human rights order ran just as deep in the decade itself. As one Carter political operative put it in the moment, the United States is, quote, the one nation where human rights is center stage for the world. Now, in fact, there was a global explosion of interest in global human rights in the 1970s, but Americans did not get there first. And in fact, what I'd like to argue to you this afternoon, in many ways, Americans and the United States got there last. In my talk, I want to make a set of arguments about why a global frame matters and how the emergence of a particular set of American human rights vernaculars in the 1970s is not only critical for understanding human rights history in the late 20th century, but I think also has real relevance for us today. In doing so, I want to offer a slice of the larger approach I take to Americans and human rights in my book that Haji mentioned, uh, The World Reimagined. The book itself is centrally concerned with how and why human rights went from what I call an exotic aspirational language, something that was just deeply unfamiliar as a language to Americans in the mid-20th century, to what I think is fair to say is an everyday vernacular for most Americans today. And the book does so by exploring the entanglements of the United States in what I term the rise of a global human rights imagination. In part, I argue what human rights were understood to be by the historical actors that gave them shape and form, whether in or out of the United States, is a considerably messier and more contingent process than some of the kind of linear histories that are being told around what's called the new human rights history. Much of this new human rights history has focused on two decades, the 1940s and the 1970s. And I linger in those two decades, too, in the book, but I try to approach them as contrapuntal moments, looking at a history from below rather than from above. I'm not particularly concerned with great power politics or with the state or with the diplomatic negotiations through which the international human rights legal regime came to be formed after 1945. These have been the subjects of much very good new human rights history. The central protagonists of my book and the kinds of people that I'll be talking with you about this afternoon are what today we would call non-state actors. Although back in the day, and certainly back in the 1940s, I don't think they would have referred to themselves as such. So diplomats and policymakers 
are not absent from the story that I want to tell. But again, the emphasis is on, I think, what I'd like to term human rights amateurs, who collectively, I think, brought into being a distinctly 20th century global human rights politics. And by human rights amateurs, I mean people coming at human rights from a variety of fields. Photographers, lawyers, filmmakers, doctors, musicians, physicists, statisticians, writers, clergy, grassroots activists, students, senior citizens, and as I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk, an inordinate number of dentists, particularly in the 1970s. Why there's the connection between human rights and dentistry, well, I'm not exactly sure. But these groups were, in effect, the growing face of the human rights movement. And I think, quite simply, it was these amateurs who put human rights after mid-century in a kind of believable position for a variety of American publics. The other part that I want to emphasize at the outset is that they make human rights believable, but they do so primarily on a global or a transnational canvas. The ways in which a global transformation of affect fundamentally conditioned how human rights were experienced and felt in the 1940s and the 1970s is at the center of my work. How it felt to have human rights or how it felt to lose a human right were critical to the growing believability of a global human rights imagination and its various American vernaculars. So too, were new ways of apprehending how the suffering of strangers might come to matter as much as one's own. In foregrounding shifts of global affect and feeling for the making of human rights history, my analysis does depart from some more common historical practices, not so much just in the writing of human rights history, but in the writing of international or diplomatic history more generally. For some reason, historians seemingly more easily articulate the imagined physicality of geopolitics. Geopolitics is an imaginary too, right? But for realists, that seems to be one that they can get quite easily. On the other hand, the historical present is often understood effectively before it's understood in other ways. Um, and Hadi was saying, thinking about affect theory, particularly thinking about the work of my colleague Lauren Berlant in English, helps us see, I think, what's largely remained uh, invisible to historians in these processes. Berlant writes, the present is not an object, but a mediated affect. It is a thing that is sensed and under constant revision, a genre of social time and practice in which a relation of person or worlds is sensed to be changing but the rules of habitation and the genres of storytelling about it are unstable. Human rights and its believability, it seems to me, emerged in just such volatile and unstable moments. Now, that these American sensibilities had global roots, as I say, is essential for the argument that I want to make. It might sound like by focusing on the United States, and its place in the making of a global human rights politics that I'm returning to some of the exceptionalist narratives that have driven not only the history of the American place in human rights history, but a sort of more general exceptionalism about uh, the American experience. My aim is actually quite the opposite, and that's to provincialize how Americans operate on, on the world stage by lifting up processes critical to how Americans came to see uh, human rights, but processes that originate far beyond American shores. So in doing so, it's an effort to think about where human rights and human rights politics are in American history in frames that are both larger and smaller than the nation. Now, it can be difficult for US historians to acknowledge the extent to which American engagement in global human rights politics in the 1970s was as much, if not more, the story of the importation of ideas into the United States rather than the exportation of American values out in the world. If Americans had been fully present at the creation of a global human rights order in the 1940s, they were, and the first half of my book lingers in that decade. The language of human rights 
simply vanished from American political discourse until 1970. But by the end of the 1970s, human rights were everywhere on the American scene. So what I want to focus on is the decade of the 1970s here. If people are curious about the 40s, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But again, just to say that we have this strange kind of thing happening. Human rights are there in the 40s in domestic and foreign policy discourse in the United States. They disappear and then reemerge in the 1970s. So I'm interested in part in understanding why they disappear and then why they reappear in the ways in which they do. Critically, when human rights moves in the 1970s from the margins of global political discourse to become a central optic for many states and peoples in the ways in which they saw the world around them, that happened, as I say, almost everywhere else in the world before it happened in the United States. Not only was Amnesty International, the leading global human rights non-governmental organization in the 1970s, a European importation into American politics, the basic contours of human rights thought and practice in the United States were deeply shaped by a translocal network of actors in the Soviet Union, in Latin America, in Asia, and in Western Europe. Soviet dissidents come to the language of human rights for the first time in the 1960s. So too do Western European leaders in this period of time in conversations that eventually will produce the Helsinki Accords of the early 1970s, the accords that in some ways normalize a thinking about human rights in terms of the relationship between the Soviet East and Western Europe. Anti-torture activists in Uruguay, in Brazil, in Chile, and in South Korea find human rights in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And again, just to kind of hit this point home, Americans initially are bit players in all of this. Human rights, in fact, is best thought of in 1970s America as a kind of guest language, one that returned to the cultural politics of the United States through what Americans came to know about the thought and practice of dissidents in the Soviet Union, political activists in Latin America and Asia, and such transnational rights advocates as Amnesty International. It is, I'll argue today, broader global transformations, ones that set this guest language of global human rights in motion, that need attention before we can even begin to appreciate the American turn to human rights later in the 1970s. Now, simply in terms of sheer numbers, there's no question that the decade of the 1970s is both a transformative and a transnational human rights NGO moment. Amnesty International reported 32,000 members in 1970. We were talking about this in class a little bit. So there are four billion people in the world in 1970. 32,000 of them are members of Amnesty. It's not a particularly robust showing, right? I mean, we can say in 1970, very few people had heard or knew about what Amnesty did. You fast forward to 1980. You have hundreds of thousands of people who are Amnesty members. You have Amnesty chapters in almost every place in the world. And Amnesty has a Nobel Peace Prize as a way of talking about the growing prestige of the organization. That's really quite a rapid shift in simply a 10-year period of time. But it's not all about amnesty. Beyond amnesty, the number of international non-governmental organizations working on human rights increases exponentially in the 1970s. Again, a hinge moment for thinking about where these groups come from. The surge of transnational non-state human rights politics, however, was part of a larger global explosion in social mobilization in the decade. Human rights advocacy doesn't emerge separately than other things going on in the world. And this has been one of the limitations of the kind of new human rights historiography. Part of what the historiography has tried to do is to recover a set of developments that we just didn't talk about in the past. And in that way, the historiography is really valuable. If you were reading an international history of the 20th century written 25 years ago, you wouldn't have read very much about human rights politics. The uh, 1948, the Universal Declaration and on, really wouldn't have been a central part to the way in which people were narrating all of that. 
that's changed in really radical ways as people have begun to recover that, yes, in fact, these kinds of issues were salient to a variety of publics in this period of time. But in doing so, sometimes this history separates out what's happening with human rights from other global developments in that period. So I think what's crucial to emphasize here, I don't have time to go into it in detail, is that there's a new politics of humanitarianism that's emerging in the world in the 1970s. There's a new politics of environmentalism that's emerging in the 1970s. There is a new politics of global feminism that's emerging in the 1970s. Human rights politics is emerging in parallel with that. And the same kinds of forces that are shaping and propelling how it is human rights politics emerges are also shaping and propelling these other global social movements as well. So again, trying to put human rights back into a larger stream of history in that period of time. There is, I would argue, a profound shift in world order in the 1970s. And it's of two parts, one structural and one effectual. And that those shifts are what's driving not only global human rights politics, but also these larger global social mobilizations. On the structural level, the state-based political and economic structures that had formed the Cold War international order after World War II began to become undone. But just as importantly, the rise of new effective bonds between the individual, the state, and the world community also started to reshape the kinds of claims that people could make in the international sphere and their believability to a variety of global publics. These are bonds, I argue, that were fashioned by the growing power and authority of moral witness in the 1970s in framing conceptions of suffering and injustice. It's these two sets of transformations then, structural and effectual, that I want to linger a little bit on today, kind of work you through what those are so that you can see how working together they do help to lift up this new way of thinking about human rights. I want to start with the structural transformations and I'm going to move through those a little bit faster because I'm guessing there are people in the room that some of this is going to be more familiar to. The effectual stuff, I hope, will strike you as more original. I like to think that it's more original. I'll probably linger a little bit more on the, on the effectual. But the structural is a necessary precondition for getting there. So let me get you through that relatively quickly. It seems to me quite fair to say that the 1970s were a tipping point between the World War II world and the one that we live in today. Again, with a set of changes in economic structure, in the structure of patterns of migration and in the structures of the ways in which information globally circulates and moves in the world. And that together, this began to unmoor the kind of international order that had been established after 1945. The most important of these is the rise of global finance capital in the 1970s that began to upend the kind of statist economic planning and also the public provision of social welfare that were among the central building blocks of political order domestically and internationally after 1945. Empowering markets at the expense of government, and again, this is familiar to many of you, the 1970s globalization phenomena brought an erosion in the capacity of nation states to manage their own economies, and also halted the construction of the post-war welfare state in its various American, European, and Japanese iterations. Political scientists in the 1970s struggled in some ways to find a language, a vocabulary, to talk about what these changes might mean. But what they eventually sort of lighted on was the notion of complex interdependence. That's the kind of political science vocabulary of the late 1970s, a phrase coined to try to talk about the ways in which state and non-state actors were operating somewhat differently in the international system. That the Cold War superpower regime that had seemed to be the essential structure, again, was coming unmoored in one form or another. Now, the state, of course, does not disappear in this period of time, but there is a kind of deterritorialization de that's going on that I think is important to keep in mind. The state starts to reinvent itself in certain ways in the 1970s. It became, to use the political scientist Anne-Marie Slaughter's term, a disaggregated state. 
in which its component parts, particularly legislators, judges, and regulatory agents of the state, began to form a variety of linkages, some of them vertical, some of them horizontal. And these linkages were ones that allowed people to talk across on a whole variety of issues. Some of those issues were straight up economic issues. They were trade, they were finance, but increasingly they were around issues of the environment and eventually around human rights as well. So there's a kind of movement of, again, a disaggregated group of actors within the state who are starting to have cross-national conversations around these kinds of things. The second key structural element in the 70s, it seems to me, is what the end of empire means for shifting patterns, global patterns of migration in the 1970s. Um, the end of empire essentially comes in the 1970s. It really should have come much earlier than the 1970s, but Portugal in particular just couldn't let go. So it's finally in the 1970s that Portugal lets go of its colonies. And it's fair to say that that post-war era of decolonization is coming to an end. What's interesting is as decolonization comes to an end, the ways in which people are moving around the world is starting to change. So in the first decades of the post-45 period, it was flows of people around Europe that were largely the ways in which migration patterns were working. And that begins to shift to flows of people with Asian and African origins as we move into the 1970s. So fundamentally, who it is that's on the move in the globe is different. There are a lot of reasons for this. One is the colonizing wars of independence or heightened uh, ethnic conflict is accounting for a certain share of this movement. But again, there are a variety of explanations for why this is so. But for our purposes in thinking about human rights politics in the 1970s, significantly many of who would become the primary subjects of global human rights advocacy in the 1970s emerged out of these conflicts. So these new peoples who are on the move become significant actors in and of themselves in human rights politics and also objects of empathy and action. Third and finally, there are technological changes that are going on in the 1970s, really beginning in the 1960s, that become very important for just the on the ground practices of how human rights politics begins to work. The first global communication satellite launched in the 1960s, television ownership um, increasing dramatically worldwide, so the instantaneous circulation of mass images much more prevalent in the 1970s than it would have been in the 1950s. Jet travel, the cost of getting around by jet travel are halved in the 1960s. So in fact, if you're a startup NGO in the 1970s, moving from place to place to investigate problems becomes economically much more feasible than it would have been in an earlier period of time. And finally, faxes and overnight mail emerge in the 1970s too. Now this is another thing that we were talking about in class today. When I talk to students about this, at least back at the University of Chicago, they don't look very convinced when I start talking about faxes and overnight mail being an especially impressive form of moving information around, right? I mean, with social media, with the internet, these all seem like sort of like grandpa's ways of kind of like getting things around. But put yourself in the moment, right? In the 1970s, this enabled things that were not possible with global advocacy before. A fax machine lets you immediately communicate something to another party and actually lets you move quite a bit of factual information around fast. So too, overnight mail did the same thing. When I talked to activists in the 1970s, they would tell me over and over again, it was overnight mail, Mark. That was what allowed us to move as quickly as we could on a whole series of what we called urgent action items in that period of time, right? So, just, if it's a little hard to imagine that kind of creaky fax machine sending things along, it's just social media only in a kind of earlier stage, right? Um, the other thing I want to introduce as a kind of caveat with all this is, I don't mean to suggest that globalization started in the 1970s. I don't mean to say that globalization as we know it is only a phenomena that the late 20th century helps us to understand and explain. It's clear that globalization has a wider and deeper history. It's clear that in the late 19th century, for instance, global flows of trade and investment and labor were very intense, perhaps more intense than they are today. So again, 
I don't want to reify this period into not having a longer history as well. But I'll put that caveat out. On the other hand, to overly stress these kinds of historical continuities over time, these sort of meta-continuities, I do think risks obscuring the singularities of the decade of the 1970s, in which the intensity and velocity of global networks did begin to reshape the nation state in quite fundamental ways. And I think also um, bundle relationships between sovereignty, territoriality, and state power. So again, one wants to put themselves in the moment, in a sense, and really appreciate what's changing and how actors on the ground in that moment are reacting to those changes. So those kind of structural things, economics, technology, migratory patterns, again, structurally very important in enabling this rise of a particular kind of global human rights politics in the 1970s. But the other part of this is, I think, a fundamental change in affect in how people thought and felt about global politics, international politics, and their own relationship to knowledge and what persuaded them that perhaps there were problems that they needed to attend to in very far distant places in the world or, in fact, right at home. In this new global affect in the 1970s, a belief in the authenticity of the interior world of individual suffering rather than external structures that might have first actually produced that suffering was central, I think, to the kinds of claims that activists made in this decade. Individual consciousness, lived experience, moral witness, and a testimonial turn became virtual key words for activists in this era and began to reshape the nature of global politics and global morality. The rise of an emergent Holocaust consciousness and its insistence on the power of witness and testimony, I think, was critical to the emergence of these new structures of feeling in the 1970s. Now, one of the things that people have argued is that it's the Holocaust that, in fact, enables the beginnings of a global human rights order right after World War II. That there's a direct connection between what today we call the Holocaust and essentially the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a whole variety of covenants and conventions that emerge from that. What seems clearer now is that yes, people did know that there was incredible violence that had been done to European Jews and other groups after World War II because there were photographs that were circulating throughout the world. There was newsreel coverage of this. People knew that something had happened in the camps. But the Holocaust, as we think about the Holocaust today, as we remember it today, is really a project that begins in earnest in the 1960s and comes to a kind of full fruition in the 1970s. So again, it's not to say that in a larger way, the Holocaust doesn't hover over 1940s politics, but the particular ways that we think about it emerge out of this period. And the one thing that I want to kind of take you through to try to push on this point a little bit um, is the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Israel in 1962. It's a real danger for a historian to say, this is where something first began. Because the minute you do that, somebody in the room puts up their hands and says, you know, you say it's in 1962, but really it was in 1957 and it's that trial. So I, I realize that there's a danger of overstatement here, but I want to do it again because I think the Eichmann trial does put into motion something that becomes really, really important for human rights politics as it emerges. So for people who don't know Eichmann or the trial, Eichmann is a former SS officer. He's living under a false identity in Argentina. He'd been captured by uh, Israeli intelligence agents a couple years before 1962 brought to stand trial in Israel for his role in organizing the mass deportations of European Jews into Nazi extermination camps such as Auschwitz during World War II. It was a 56-day trial, and it put the Holocaust on the front page of newspapers throughout the world. But something happened in the trial that was unprecedented, 
And that was the decision of the Israeli prosecutor to call more than 100 victims of Nazi policy to testify directly at the trial. At the Nuremberg trials in the late 1940s, the other trials that we think about in connection to what came to be thought of as the Holocaust, perpetrators and written documentation were the focal points of the trial, right? Nazi perpetrators and legal documents, the kinds of ways we think about the way in which the law might work. But the voices of victims were to the side at Nuremberg. That was not the way in which people conceived that that particular legal mechanism was going to work. But now, at this trial, victims are front and center in making the case against Eichmann. Now again, to say, okay, it's the Eichmann moment, that's where we get this sort of testimonial, I'm going to go even farther and say that the first victim who testifies, this is the moment that we can point to to think about where this testimonial turn comes from. And it's, it's a kind of wonderful story. It's a woman named Ada Lichtman, and she comes before um, the court, and that she says that she wants to speak in Yiddish and not in Hebrew, because only by speaking in Yiddish can she actually convey the horrors of what it was that she saw, right? So again, the notion that a particular language would give authenticity to the kinds of things that are being talked about in that moment is important, I think. One observer wrote in the moment, suddenly the language of the exterminated Jewish population of Europe filled the courtroom. You shivered on hearing the words of the language of the slaughtered and the burned. So the trial became a pedagogic project in which Lichtman and more than 100 victims remembered their own survival and often quite graphically, the murder of European Jews by the Nazi regime. But the survivor testimony resonated beyond the courtroom in Israel, and I think is a really important enabling condition for the kinds of Holocaust remembrance consciousness that comes in the 1970s. It, it, it helps to explain not just where it comes from, but the form it takes. I think most importantly, the form that it takes. But it also had other effects, and that's what I'm most concerned about with you today, is simply that testimonial turn, that notion of moral witness, begins to inflect the way in which a whole variety of global social mobilizations begin to work in the 1970s. When people are talking about a new kind of humanitarianism, when people are talking about an environmentalism that's different than a kind of conservationism that had been a part of sort of international dialogue before, and for our purposes, most importantly, with human rights, testimonial practices become central to the ways in which these claims are made and also to the ways in which they're heard and seen to be persuasive by a variety of publics. Our regard for the authenticity of experience, concerns with the psyche, the therapeutic and the emotions become as important as detached analytical research and statistical measures in making truth claims. In that sense, moral witness comes to shape, I think, this new global affect of the 1970s. Amnesty is a good example of this. Its foundational practice was and is to bear witness to the suffering of nonviolent innocents, to demand their release on the sole ground that their suffering was unjust, and it was hoped, and is hoped, to generate a collective sense of purpose amongst sympathetic global publics. If witness and testimony increasingly served as a mechanism for staking claims in the international sphere in the 1970s, it was accompanied by a real rupture in how expert knowledge was constituted. And that, too, came to inform how the politics and morality of global social mobilizations worked. The authority of non-state actors like Amnesty International in the 1970s increasingly rested on a new ground of expertise, one in which sentiment and reason were blended in ethically motivated empirical inquiries that combined personal testimony, statistics, and independent research. What one anthropologist has usefully termed motivated truth. Now, in making this argument, I don't mean to suggest that more conventional forms of knowledge suddenly went out the window in the 1970s. 
key epistemological qualities such as quantification, empiricism, and objectivity that had made up what came to be considered the hallmarks of professional expertise in the mid-20th century remain an important part of witnessing in the 1970s as well. But increasingly, at least among groups like Amnesty, they're refracted through a moral frame in which the knowledge produced and circulated by transnational advocacy groups was doing political work of one sort or another. The other thing that's changing is who's seen as legitimately having knowledge? Who's conveying knowledge to you that you find believable? So in the 1950s or early 1960s, for instance, if you were wondering about nuclear matters of some sort, you're worried about nuclear proliferation, you're worried about uh, nuclear power at home, maybe Robert Oppenheimer would have been the figure that you would have turned to, right? The scientist at Los Alamos that's most closely associated with the construction of the atomic bomb during World War II. But an individual figure like Oppenheimer, he would be the authority that would help us understand these complicated problems. If you were in economics world and you were a liberal, maybe John Kenneth Galbraith would do the same thing for you. If you were a conservative, maybe it would be Milton Friedman. But again, it was an individual. Note, all male individuals, but it was an individual. What's happening now in the 1970s and beyond is that collectivities begin to operate like individuals had in being a trusted source of knowledge. Amnesty not the head of Amnesty, not a person necessarily. I mean, there is different general secretaries of Amnesty. They do have profiles, et cetera, et cetera. But that it's the collectivity of the organization. Médecins Sans Frontières, for instance, if we're thinking about the humanitarian world in the same period of time, these collectivities are trusted as individual experts might have been trusted in an earlier period. As these collectivities are putting forward truth, or what they believe to be a motivated truth, out into the world, they're just as interested in talking to individuals about their own experiences as they are in marshalling, again, what we would see as more empirical ways around these problems. A good example of this are country reports. Amnesty did, and still does, write country reports. It's the fundamental way that they intervene in what they see as human rights crises or problems. So a country report essentially would be the result of a fact-finding mission. Amnesty would send uh, a doctor. Amnesty would send a lawyer. Amnesty would send a journalist. Some, some combination of professional experts who would go and try to figure out as much as they could on the ground, if they're allowed in the country to do that kind of fact-finding, about what's happening. At the same time, they would interview people, victims, of what often were human rights abuses in the places where they were doing these kinds of fact-finding missions. And then the country reports would be a kind of blend of both. So for instance, in 1973, there's a coup in Chile. It brings down the Allende government and a general by the name of Pinochet takes power in Chile and will have power in Chile for quite some time. There are uh, accusations of massive abuses of human rights by the Pinochet government against Chilean people as a result of this coup. And Amnesty goes in with a fact-finding mission. And they are going to jails. They're trying to figure out you know, how many, to the extent that the regime will let them figure it out, how many people are incarcerated. How many people have been tortured? How many people have been disappeared? So again, the kinds of knowledge that classically you would want in a legal case, for instance, if you were going to be at Nuremberg, you'd want these kinds of things so that you could make a strong factual case. But as Amnesty wrote these country reports, they also were giving testimonials to people who they met in country about their experiences directly with torture or other forms of incarceration, or sometimes it's people talking about the experiences of loved ones that they lost. Amnesty is very, very explicit in this report. And again, this report becomes sort of the gold standard for how these reports are written to the present day. I was reading an Amnesty report just yesterday, written in October. It could have been written in 1973 in the basic kind of methodological ways that Amnesty combined fact-finding and personal testimony. 
The other thing Amnesty was trying to do was to perform a kind of impartiality. Why would you believe Amnesty? What if Amnesty wasn't trustworthy? Nobody knew who Amnesty was in the 1970s, right? So they're, they're staking a kind of claim for who they are at the same time. And that claim is often made by Amnesty by using this word over and over again, they are impartial. And there are different ways that they display their impartiality in this period of time. Some of it is by carefully looking at human rights cases across a variety of kinds of societies. So nobody can say they're just going after communist states, they're just going after democratic states, they're just going after third world states. They're trying to be everywhere. But even more important than that, they're invoking a universality. The amnesty reports are never especially interested in structural causes for human rights violations. In fact, you go back to the 73 report on Chile, again, this sort of like model for the ways in which Amnesty would write these reports moving forward, and they explicitly say, we don't want to talk about Allende. We don't want to talk about Pinochet. We don't want to talk about structurally what might have been going on economically, politically, or socially in Chile. That's not our concern. Our concern is simply to tell you that people's rights have been violated. So they do that by showing you with figures, and they do that by showing you with testimony, often very graphic testimony of what it meant to be tortured or incarcerated. In a sense, human rights reporting and advocacy, evidence about individual testimony and empiricism become kind of entangled, like I'm pulling them apart, as if you can really easily see there's this, there's that. But in fact, they're just entangled in the ways in which these reports are written, one helping define the other as these truth claims are being made about what human rights or the loss of human rights means in a particular place. Now, it should be said that there are blind spots in thinking about human rights in this particular kind of way. In a classic essay, Joan Scott writes, quote, the evidence of experience precludes critical examination of the working of the ideological system that produce those experiences and the historically contingent structures of power and authority that gave them shape and form. It is not individuals, Scott writes, who have experience, but subjects who are constituted through experience. Amnesty and other human rights groups in the 1970s, as I say, often encouraged only a minimal exploration of political conditions, revolutionary ideology, or military power in reporting on human rights abuses. Nor was Amnesty particularly concerned about what might be lost through the lens of personal experience. Amnesty and its supporters worked for the release of individual prisoners of conscience across the world, full stop. Individual suffering mattered, not the structures of power that produced it. The 1970s global human rights imagination, like these broader global social mobilizations of which it was a part, emerged within these new structures of feeling, that in privileging witness and the experiential began, I think, to remake existing notions of power and authority. Yet the dynamics that produced the embrace of human rights in the 1970s were far more intricate than a simple appropriation of a novel transnational language. Instead, what human rights would come to mean over the decade and those meanings were often unstable and contested, both within and between states, was worked out across a variety of local vernaculars. The global and local human rights imagination of the era, in a sense, co-produced one another. And also, they never fully crowded out other modes of understanding and speaking about social suffering and injustice. So they're operating, again, in a wider political and moral sphere. Human rights in the 1970s remained a protean concept. It operated everywhere as a guest language that, again, produced a variety of local vernaculars, once sometimes in tension with other forms of moral and political visions. And just as it did for the creation of a global human rights imagination elsewhere in the world, 
The transnational lens of moral witness came to powerfully shape American understandings from the mid to late 1970s about what it meant to have and to lose human rights. So when human rights comes with full force to the United States in the 1970s, its global circulations as a transnational guest language would shape both the reach and the limits of an American human rights vernacular. Many Americans would work out what human rights meant on the ground through grassroots efforts. Some through Amnesty International USA, but there were also 400 new human rights groups that emerged in the United States in the 1970s. And that's just at the national level, right? So when you start to look at a state level or you start to look at a more local level, thousands of new groups that are self-consciously calling themselves human rights groups emerge in the United States in this period of time. As they did, Americans were engaging and thinking about human rights through what they came to know about how human rights was being talked about in other parts of the world. I talk about this more fully in the book, but just to give you a kind of broad brushstroke of this, American human rights vernaculars in the 1970s were forged in part through the transnational flow of writings by dissidents from the Soviet East. So figures like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Andrei Sakharov, and Vaclav Havel emerge in the 1970s as global human rights icons. The ways they talk about what human rights means to their struggle, and they too are vernacularizing human rights to serve particular political purposes of their own in the Soviet Union or in Vaclav Havel's case in Czechoslovakia but the ways in which they do that being refracted back into the United States. Now, people who grew up in this period of time may recall Solzhenitsyn publishes this like magnum opus three volume, The Gulag Archipelago. Does that you, anybody remember the moment of the Gulag? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm a little skeptical. It's 1,800 pages long. A lot of people had Gulag like on the coffee table. I'm not so sure how many people actually made their way all the way through Gulag. But people had a sense, for instance, the Times does this whole long kind of exerting from Gulag. And again, the stealing a kind of essence of what Solzhenitsyn is talking about in this. And again, it's giving Americans new ways of thinking about how human rights might work in the world. It's also being that these ideas, American ideas about human rights, are also getting formed by the circulation of testimonials about human rights abuses in Latin America. Sometimes that's coming in directly through like this sort of country report thing that I was talking about with Amnesty International, but often it's happening in cultural forms that are, are much more widely seen. So in folk art, in music, in film, in painting in the 1970s, one begins to see that Latin American testimonial turn start to turn into an American testimonial turn at the same time. And this all helps to kind of further define this 1970s American human rights imaginary around the practices of torture and disappearance by military regimes in the Southern Cone. Now, human rights also became embedded for the first time in American professional practices in the 1970s. And I would argue that that development is probably most important for understanding the persistence of a concern with human rights in the United States today. It was in the 1970s that lawyers, scientists, doctors, nurses, all these dentists found human rights. And once they found human rights in the 1970s, they really never let go. It's a moment of kind of emergent professionalization around human rights as well. This human rights center, my human rights center, in some ways have their origins back in the 1970s around law schools who for the first time began teaching courses on international human rights law and where in effect human rights centers first emerged. Now you see the spread of a concern with human rights across multiple fields. You go to medical school, people are concerned about human rights, it's part of the curriculum. Again, you're trained as a nurse, you're trained perhaps as a teacher. And the ways in which scientists in the 1970s had to struggle with, can you be a scientist and also have a political position around human rights? Coming into the 70s, many scientists answered that question, no. 
coming out of the 70s? Many scientists answered that question, yes. And that yes answer is one that, again, has moved forward and deepened and intensified over time. So you get a thickness to a kind of believability in human rights, not so much because Jimmy Carter is giving an inaugural address about human rights, but because a set of, again, structural and effectual changes have happened in the international system that are then picked up and understood by Americans in a variety of particular ways. But there are limits on what that American human rights imagination turns out to be in the 1970s. As I said at the outset, I'm looking at two decades in this book, the 1940s and the 1970s. And in the 1940s, Americans look at human rights in two different ways. They're concerned with the global order that's being established at the United Nations, the sort of international dimension of what human rights politics might be about. But many Americans are keen to use glo emergent global human rights norms in civil rights struggles at home in a whole variety of ways. There are dozens of legal cases that move through state and federal court in the late 1940s and early 1950s that are making claims about housing discrimination, education discrimination, voting discrimination, uh, issues about access to health, a whole variety of political, civil, economic, and social rights. They make constitutional arguments in those cases, as you would expect people to do, but they also make international human rights claims as well. They argue to judges that because the United States signed the UN Charter and that the Senate ratified the treaty, and because explicitly in Articles 55, 56, and 57, human rights is spelled out as a value that the states who are signing the treaty should uh, honor, that international law is now an additional reason, along with constitutional law, that these rights violations should be redressed. No Supreme Court opinion ever gives primacy to the international human rights claims, but a number of concurring opinions by justices at the Supreme Court level, but also below, and some courts do actually give primacy to it at lower levels, um, say that, yeah, you know, this is yet another tool that we can think with and use in thinking about these kinds of problems. So anyway, in the 1940s, you have a kind of remarkable moment in the United States where the international is being used directly for social movements, for a variety of kinds of justice. When human rights comes back into American politics in the 1970s, the domestic dimension of it does not come back. Most of the major social movements of the 1970s, and I would say beyond, do not come back to the frame of global human rights treaties as a way of staking their case for justice in the United States. So human rights in the 1970s is largely thought about as a problem that's happening someplace else. Chile has human rights problems. Argentina has human rights problems. China will come to have human rights problems. A whole variety of states have human rights problems, but they're a way to talk about something, again, that's happening beyond American shores. So it's a more limited vision of what human rights can do in an American context that's coming back in the 1970s. And also to stress that it's a more limited notion of what kind of rights Americans might want to pay attention to. Again, in the 1940s, there's a more capacious sense that political and civil as well as economic and social rights might be the ways in which we would think about human rights. In the 1970s, by and large, the focus is on political and civil rights, particularly around the rights to bodily integrity for victims of human rights abuses, again, committed outside of American shores. I would say that the evacuation of human rights language for domestic purposes has pretty much persisted from the 1970s to the present day. There are two exceptions to that, and we can talk about it more in the Q&A. Um, for Native Americans and the indigenous rights movement, it's quite different. I think for the gay rights movement, actually, it's quite different. Um, but for most social movements, they have not been attracted, particularly to a human rights language, as a fundamental way of thinking about the cause. So you think about Black Lives Matters, you think about um, 
uh, the fight for 15, you think about a variety of immigrants' rights organizations. Rhetorically, sometimes people will talk about human rights or they'll talk about the Universal Declaration, but the way they want to think about the problem is often structural, not universalized, right? So it's structural racism, it's structural problems within the political economy of the United States that people see as the essential explanation for why rights are being violated. So again, human rights can operate rhetorically for people, but they don't give people seemingly a way to understand the problem at hand. You might really go back to the 1970s and think a little bit about, again, that set of decisions that were both consciously and unconsciously made to depoliticize, to destructurize in some ways how groups like Amnesty thought and talked about human rights. Um, by way of conclusion, I promise that this would all say something about um, our present moment. In our present moment, just in February of 2016, uh, at a campaign event in South Carolina, then presidential candidate Donald Trump said, don't tell me it doesn't work. Torture works. You know, half these guys say it doesn't, but believe me, it works, okay? We've come to be familiar with Trump's cadences. Alex Baldwin can do this much better than I can, but you get the basic message here. Trump actually, you know, saying at a campaign event, wouldn't it be good to start torturing again? From the standpoint of who's in power in the White House, it's fair to say that these are somewhat dark days for human rights. When I finished writing The World Imagined, a few observers, including myself, anticipated that we would now live in the world of Donald Trump, a president who believes in torture, a president who believes in the forced deportation of immigrants, a president who believes in a Muslim ban, a president who has ordered a ban on transgendered peoples who are serving in the military, a president who believes that neo-Nazis have a moral equivalence to those who are engaged in peaceful protest, and a president who seems only too eager to begin vigorously shaking the hands of authoritarian despots. A lot has changed in less than a year. At the same time, as I was saying before, human rights had receded as a kind of oppositional language within the United States in the 1970s, right? So it would seem maybe in this moment that how do you know what human rights, what kind of political work human rights might do in this kind of situation? Can it be recovered in some ways as a domestic lexicon, a powerful one by which people might think about what Trump and his allies are doing? In that sense, I think it is really important to remember that what happened in the 1970s had something to do with Jimmy Carter, it had something to do with Congress, it had something to do with, you know, there was an administration policy around human rights, there was a congressional policy around human rights, but that there was essentially a bottom-up and a kind of middle-over way of thinking about human rights that became very, very embedded in how it is a large number of Americans have come to think about the world. But as I say, there was this bifurcation between that happening someplace else and then what was happening at home and where the language fit. I wonder, and I don't know, maybe human rights just can't help today. Maybe there are other languages. Maybe it is the language of structure that helps to understand and get past the problems that we face today. But on the other hand, it might be that human rights could seem to have more relevance today. Because now, whether the human rights violations are happening someplace else or whether they're happening right at home has become blurred, right? When the first Muslim ban went into effect, and literally for a weekend, the nation's airports were sites of detention, it's hard to tell where is the human rights problem. Is it at home? Is it someplace else? Because it's harder to tell, because it's more mixed up, it may well be that these ways of thinking about human rights problems that we've thought about so carefully in thinking about how other states and people are behaving themselves can come back home and animate what it is Americans are thinking about, at least Americans who are not supportive of the sets of policies that the new administration has brought. It's difficult to say whether that would be the case or whether that would not be the case. 
But again, it's worth thinking about that division emerges in the 70s. It grows between the international and the domestic. Is there a way that now that division might come back together? That's what I have for you, um, but happy to hear your thoughts, take any questions. Sorry. Um, do you, okay, so you were talking about how, oh, um, wow. <laughs> you were talking about how there was more like use of human rights language kind of in the 40s, mm -hmm. like around when the Declaration of Human Rights was enacted, yeah. and then it kind of fell off, yeah. um, like in the United States yeah. too, right? Just right. so I'm clear. Right. Okay, um, I, I see that, but do you also see like, I feel like there's an exceptionalism that exists in the United States, um, kind of like across the board and we, I just don't really believe that there was ever a real value for human rights, like actually just kind of more of a use of the language. Does that make sense? Do you like see what I'm kind of saying? Just I because, yeah. Um, yeah. There, well, I had a point that I was gonna say, but I think that like the use of the language in the 40s was kind of as a result of like countries um, signing on to the Declaration of Human Rights to show that it's kind of like a hierarchy or like status kind of thing. There's that I feel like that's kind of entwined in that. Yeah. Does that is that like valid at all? Uh, no, I understand what you're saying. I I think it's kind of a matter of thinking like. Who, what actors are you thinking most about? So if you're thinking about solely state actors, I think in a lot of cases, and in this way, Americans aren't so exceptional, that there's a certain amount of hypocrisy that goes on about a state signing on or not signing on to a particular human rights instrument. And then in practice, whether they observe it, don't observe it, how they police it, how they don't police it. So at the level of kind of state practice, American or other states, I think you're absolutely right. I think when you start talking about non-state actors, and particularly when you start to talk about grassroots activists, then it's a, it's a little bit different, right? And I think what's useful is to kind of pull it apart like that. Because if it's just at the state level, in a way, the conversation stops pretty fast. If you start expanding out who you're thinking about, as potential human rights actors who seem to think that it can do stuff for them, then I think the conversation gets a little deeper and a little richer in some ways. But isn't the idea of the declaration, like, so nations sign on to it, and then I, isn't the idea behind it that like governments or nations have the responsibility to protect like the people that they that they're like civilians, for example? So right. if they sign on to the declaration, they are obligated to provide like human dignity and like health care and shelter and like everything that they should. Provide. Right. I mean, comparatively, the U.S. is like doing a lot, obviously, but I think you can make like a lot of arguments that the U.S. fails to like provide um, like adequate shelter, health care, and like in many cases, you can protect those dignity. You can, and. You know, like the Universal Declaration is aspirational. There's no enforcement teeth, right? So all you're doing is sort of pledging that in general, yes, you respect these sorts of things. And as you say, it's very uneven the way it shakes down. One thing that's kind of, I think is really interesting in the 1940s is that it's not just the Universal Declaration that people are negotiating out. People are also negotiating out a variety of regional human rights agreements. One is in Western Europe. It's an agreement that's just around political and civil rights. There's no mention of economic or social rights in the agreement, so it, it is admittedly more limited, right? But one of the things that's included in the con European Convention is a transnational court. The court doesn't get operational until the 1980s. So this is like 1948 when the European Convention is being drafted. It's 1950 when it's ratified. Then you have to fast forward to 1986 
before this court is in operation. The reason you have to fast forward over that long period of time was European states were terrified that colonized peoples were going to use the European Convention against them in that court, and so they didn't want it operationalized. So the British and the French, in particular, really hold that down. But again, by the 1970s, largely decolonization done, there's a moment that enables the court to happen. And it is kind of remarkable in Europe what the, the record of that court is in terms of enforcement mechanisms for a variety of, again, violations of political and civil rights. So the way it works is you go to your local court, you, you keep moving up the hierarchy until you're at the equivalent of the Supreme Court. But if that case goes against you, you can go to this transnational body of justices, the European Court for Human Rights, and if you win, you not only are awarded some sort of monetary thing to, to make the rights violation not seem so difficult, but in fact the state has to change its own law to accord with advancing that particular right over time. So again, it's one of these things where, I mean, obviously nothing like this going on in the United States. The you know, United States is not interested in that. But there are places where, in fact, you do see, you know, people talk about this kind of transnational governance being very thin. And in certain ways, that's right. But the European court, I think, is one example where you can really say, on the ground, here's where there's an enforcement mechanism for an agreement that, in fact, has had real results over time. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Hathaway from the Law School. Thanks for a, a really fascinating talk. And I guess the, the part of what you offered that I think is particularly helpful is the focus on the effectual as much as what I would call the infrastructural account of human yeah. rights. And you're right, we do tend to focus way too much on the documents and the institutions and not as much on, on what you highlighted. So thank you for that. Uh, the one, the one place, though, where I have some difficulty with your account is where you set up this dissonance between the 1970s origins of human rights as individuated, focused on, on symptoms, on particulars, versus the present moment where we're more interested in structurally oriented interventionist things, and therefore the resonance of human rights is less today than it was. And I... I wonder if that might not be a bit of an anachronistic account of what mm. human rights has become. Mm. Uh, indeed, mm. at some level, you know, when my experience is that the amnesties and the human rights watches and all of the other big organs have in fact taken on that structurally oriented interventionist roles in ways that at times, I will also confess, I wish they hadn't. <laughs> because I actually worry that they've been co-opted into those broader structural debates in ways that expend resources, time, yeah. and energy that is now no longer available for what you would have called the core of the 1970s particularist, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, focused on individuals movement. So I guess the question really is, is it right that human rights hasn't responded to that structural challenge? Uh, I, I'm less convinced about that. And might it be truer to say that we ought to think about the value of what we had in the 70s and ask whether that version of human rights may not in fact be the one that we want to re-embrace rather than imagining it as in some sense being in conflict with you know, what you think the present moment requires? Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, you know, I guess I have a couple of sort of scales to respond to that on. I mean, I, I think part of the argument that I want to make is a domestic one that isn't so much about organizations as about why, how, how was it possible? I mean, I, I have some answers to this actually, but how was it possible in the 1940s that in fact it could seem as if it made sense in a domestic context. And why in the 1970s did it not have that traction? And why has that really continued to the present day? Which I think is true. It is, you know, an amnesty or a human rights watch, yes, they've expanded the sort of kinds of rights that they want to talk about. And as soon as they move into economic and social rights, then it's hard not to talk about structure, right? But that move, I don't see having much of a domestic resonance, right? So that seems to be kind of operating in a sort of transnational space. 
but not one that seems deeply tethered into a set of American practices at home. And that, I, I, I mean, I understand why people evacuate the language in the 1950s, which has to do with the Cold War, which has to do with McCarthyism, which has to do with the language now is just getting in the way. It's yet another barrier to get where you want to get, and it didn't seem like it was going to be that in the 1940s. So I, I get that. Um, but the fact that it can't ever get recovered, particularly when it becomes so resonant for so many people in the 1970s, is a bigger part of the puzzle. And it seems to me that the interest of those larger groups, there is quite a large, dis uh, there's a disconnect between where they might be going and thinking and the ways in which people are thinking about a kind of local politics in one form or another. So at that scale, um, it, it doesn't seem to have as much impact as it might. Had it been different in the 1970s, had it been both at the same time, I kind of, you know, it's like a thought experiment. What, 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 would, what would that have done, right? Would it have seen if you were a labor movement, if you were if the women's movement, if you were, you know, an immigrant movement in the 1970s, and people were talking in those kinds of languages, maybe so. Now, the two exceptions are Native American rights and gay rights. Mm. Again, it depends, I think, how, how grassroots or up you want to go, but we could, we could go back and forth on that one. Indigenous rights, I think, is particularly interesting, though, because as you're saying, I mean, there is this notion about an expanding set of what global human rights means over the course of the second half of the 20th century. Indigenous rights claims getting robust as time moves on, and Native American actors seeing that as potentially powerful for them, right? So it makes all kind of sense, in a way, to move with that movement, right? So again, there's one place where people do. Gay rights is, again, a little bit more of a puzzle for me in that regard. So there's a decision that's made by the Gay and Lesbian Task Force in 1979 to change its name to the Human Rights Campaign, the human rights campaign that we all know right now as the kind of leading uh, human rights group in the country, certainly in thinking about the marriage movement being very central in all of that. So there's this really interesting debate that goes on within that organization in 1979 about whether to change the name. And more kind of moderate people in the organization, they're the ones that want it to be the human rights campaign. More radical people say it's just recloseting and that's not right and that what you need to put front and center is the fact that it's gay rights. So the moderates win. I guess. But what's really puzzling to me about that is that that was a huge gamble in 1979. There was no way that you could know in 1979 that using human rights in the name was going to help you. It's only now that we would say, wow, that was kind of prescient, right? You know, that sort of built on blah, blah. But at the moment, not at all. So I've not been able to interview some of the, quote, more moderate people who are putting this forward, but I've always been really curious, like, why did, in the world did they believe that that was going to do any good for them? It did, but how, th there's no way they could have known that. So where was that coming from? What kind of language about human rights were they thinking about that it could do when nobody else was thinking in those kinds of ways? So there are kind of like, uh, when, you, when you again sort of scale it down into a granular level, it get, there become things that are a little bit harder to puzzle out than when it's, again, operating in in the bigger sphere. Um, you know, the other criticism of, I mean, you know these well, of, you know, sort of Human Rights Watch kind of thing is that these groups have become disconnected actors from the ground, right? I mean, Human Rights Watch always kind of had that problem, more so than Amnesty does, but both in a way, you know? Um, the notion of kind of robust chapters and grassroots organizing and amnesty seems less than it might have been before. So that kind of professionalization of what non-state actors are about, really different than the period I'm talking about too. So I don't mean to say that that skeletal structure that was operating in the 1970s is at all the reality of the ways in which these organizations are operating now. And yet, human rights reporting strikes me as so much the same 
now as it was then. It was the Rohingya report that Amnesty wrote in October that I was reading yesterday. It sounds just like the Chilean report, except that there's new technology. So now there are satellite images that you can use to, again, show that there are these violations. That kind of technology wasn't available in the 1970s, obviously. Other kinds of cutting edge technology were there. That's what people were playing on. But again, the sort of basic ways that the fact finding goes, that script doesn't seem to me that it's changed remarkably in that period of time. I don't want to delay the comments, but I think what my thought would be is that's only one component mm -hmm. of the human rights mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. the, virtually the totality of mm -hmm. those are mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. This was really, really interesting. I didn't, wasn't um, familiar with your book and I'm looking forward to getting it um, because I'm teaching about human rights in Latin America and now yeah. the Americas. Yeah. And it's very frustrating not to find uh, perspectives on the United States that fit with a kind of global context and that makes sense. And I think this one to me very much does. What I appreciate in particular is the way that you're historicizing what you're calling the evacuation of the structural critique and structural analyses and advocacy from human rights in the 1970s for particular domestic historical reasons that are not the same everywhere. So I see it as a very um, anti-Samuel Moyne kind of explanation of the uh, sort of the uh, distance between structural analysis and structural advocacy and, and human rights. Um, the one thing that I expected to hear about in this lecture and didn't hear about at all was the effect of Carter's speeches and Carter's position vis-a-vis -vis Latin America in both the uses and strategic uses of human rights in the 1970s and then also the I think something of the abandonment in the 1980s, or whether you agree that there was an abandonment in the 1980s. I see it as, as having been abandoned in the 1980s and the Reagan years because of what was perceived yeah. to be the weakness yeah. of Carter in his right. human rights focus. And hand in hand with that, especially because of the importance of the Chilean, not just the Amnesty International Report, but yeah. of course the Chilean Catholic Church's turn yes. to human rights yeah. as a way of yeah. resisting and the only voice of resistance in Chile. Yeah. And the impact that that had on Jesuits and other religious groups, including the Baptists that Jimmy Carter was coming out of yeah. on the um, legitimacy of human rights. Um, so I, I guess I was, I was surprised not to hear you talk about Carter and his, even though I understand that you're not looking at states and yeah. geopolitics, but instead you're looking at the sort of on the ground amateurs, as you call them, yeah. um, or non-state actors, but still the relationship between them seems to be fundamental. Um, so I guess that's it. I guess it was also just really interesting to me to think about how human rights is used strategically in really different ways in the United yeah. States and the other places that you've mentioned. And, um, Anyway, I don't know if it's just because of my perspective, this is what I focus on, but it seems to me that Latin America was especially powerful and especially important in, in shaping the ways that human rights were talked about in the United States, which is why Carter and the Catholic Church seem to me to be an important part of the story, even for non-state actors. Yeah. Um, you know, when you do a project like this, you decide that you're gonna go there and not there. And it didn't start like that for me. I kind of believed that I could do this state, non-state, 40s, 70s, and this would all like work in a book somehow. And it didn't. To be able to like uncover, I mean, there's an increasing literature about Carter policy and the sort of gaps between rhetorically what's said and then what policy turns out to be in Latin American states, in Central American states, in a whole variety of places, right? That literature is there. I could do more with that, I guess. But the central question for me, I, you're right, that somewhere what he's talking about, once people do the turn, is going to matter. But I guess the primary thing for me was how the turn happened, and that the turn was happening way before Carter got to it. Like, I mean, one of the things about the election that's very strange in 76 that I didn't think about coming into the, the book is that it's only in the second debate against Ford 
that he brings up human rights. There's like a scattering of mentions of human rights at campaign events, kind of dotted through the campaign, but just like here or there or, but he does it at the second debate and then he's got this guy, Jerry Rafshoon, who's his pollster. And, there is, and so there's this conversation between Rafshoon and Carter about this. And Rafshoon says, wow, you know, it just pulled through the roof when you started talking about Solzhenitsyn and about, you know, Eastern Europe and blah, blah, blah. You got, those are magic words. Like, you got you to gotta use human rights. So again, to me, it was more uncovering how was it that that pulled so well, right? I mean, I don't really mean like politically why, but why those words seem to operate on people in the way in which they did. I leave it there. The, you know, if you moved later into the 70s or into the early 80s, then thinking about where kind of executive or congressional politics goes in thinking about that, as you say, is absolutely essential. One thing that dropped out of this talk that is in the book is thinking about a variety of transnational actors the Catholic Church being one, but also um, exiles from Latin America, and seemingly their centrality, both in the United States and Europe, in bringing a certain set of testimonial practices to bear on how human rights politics work. In doing that, I'm borrowing in part from a student of ours at Chicago, Patrick Kelly, who has a book coming out from, I'll just do a little plug for Patrick's book, uh, in the spring from Cambridge University Press, that's particularly looking at the transnational ways in which human rights politics was constructed. He's a Latin Americanist in Chile and in Brazil, in Argentina. So again, it was just a sort of conscious decision for the purposes of this project to keep it there. Reagan repurposes human rights as part of relaunching the Cold War, right? So for him, human rights becomes a language that he can't really dodge, but simply repackages in a particular kind of way. But I would also argue that then that has, that, that there's more there than just Reagan, because that gets packaged into a larger sense of democracy promotion as a kind of like grand strategy for the United States, which in the post-Cold War moment, and particularly after 9-11, continues to be the ways in which the American state is thinking about things. So the sort of co-optation or the use of human rights in particular sorts of ways that happens in that transition between Carter and Reagan seems to me really, really important moving forward in thinking about where American policy goes. But I agree, you know, there probably could be more about the ways in which that's getting built on. And, and again, as you say, it's not one or the other, right? It's a kind of, it's co-produced, it's an entanglement between the two and the ways in which those things are moving together. And that would have been a useful thing to think more about. Me. We had three questions in the back. We'll just go one, two, three, and then we'll have you all answer. Hi, thanks for your talk. Yeah. Um, I'm in the middle of actually uh, analyzing human rights discourse in the Refugee Act of 1980, which was abated in the late yeah. 70s. Yeah. And I think that some of what you're discussing is we're beginning to find it in the, in the actual language of the, the uh -huh. law um, in terms of the lack of political and or, or no, social and economic rights and the uh, evacuation of human rights or there's, uh, there's a loss of kind of substance within it and it transfers to like m notions of self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and it kind of um, morphs in, in within this mm -hmm. uh, policy. And so I was wondering if, and you also mentioned about uh, immigration or a, 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 a changing su subject around that time. And so wondering if the fact that it's this refugee other that's kind of a recipient of human rights was a part of that evacuation at yeah. that time. Yeah. Grab the next one. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Susan Waltz from the School of Public Policy. I Thanks. really enjoyed the, the talk. Uh, in some large measure, it took me um, on a trip down memory lane, and that was, that was kind of fun. I joined Amnesty International, I think, in 1977, the year it uh, huh? I'm betraying the my age a little bit here. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your comments towards the end about lessons, insights for life in the Trump era, and that's what I'd like to actually yeah. ask you to explore. When you were talking about the 1970s, you talked a lot about the sensibilities, but didn't say very much about the methodologies of advocacy in that period, which 
I remember very well as letter writing. Yes. Right? So letter writing has gone terribly out of fashion over the intervening three or four decades. And um, I kind of wonder what you think might take its place. The clicktivism of our, <laughs> of our current uh, uh, period clearly doesn't quite have the same uh, impact, at least in engaging people. One of the things about writing those old letters was that it, it took a little bit of concentration yeah. and engagement. And once you were engaged, then you wanted to continue to follow. And also the context of the time, the people that you were writing to, especially if you were writing from the north, so the, the west, the yeah. western Europe or the US, you imagined in a way that you had your identity. At, I'm speaking to you, Mr. President of Pakistan, as an American, yeah. and implied is that there's you know, the power of the, the government. So that's gone. That trust has really been yeah. eroded, et cetera, yeah. in public officials. So how does that play out? How do you think it, it might work in the contemporary period? That's okay. the general question. Yeah. And I think there was one back to you. To me? OK. Um, can I go there and then back to immigration? Just because, yeah. Um, two, two things. One um, is, so if you go to the Amnesty Archives, uh, Amnesty USA Archives, some of the minutes from the meetings of local chapters are actually preserved there. Now, it's skewed because you would expect that like the university chapters probably kept the minutes, the ones that weren't quite you know, so professionalized kept less minutes and that does turn out to be the case. But there's a fascinating series of 10 years of minutes over the course of the 70s from the Morningside Height chapter. And they, and so what I, what I began to appreciate was both it was, it was the form, right, of what people were doing, the letter writing, but it was also the solidarity. So they had prisoners for years and people would meet on a monthly basis or you know, some kind of regular basis and they'd talk and they'd say, well, wow, we've had this prisoner for a long time. I don't know that we're getting anywhere. Like, should we just let this one go and take another one? No, 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 we can't do that. But just people actually having kind of moral conversations about what they were doing as part of these meetings, you know? So that I think it's a solitary thing about the letter writing, although people could have done that in a collective space too, but that there was also an amazing amount of solidarity going on for people who were regularly attending these kinds of things in talking out at a very local, individual, granular level the sort of big politics of it all. So those were, for me, like getting kind of in the head of what people were thinking in that period of time, super helpful. To speak more directly to your question about forms of activism, um, I think that there are a couple of new forms of human rights practice that seem very promising in terms of activism that fundamentally isn't, I mean like the click thing, you know, is trying to be like a version of, an easy version of writing or an easy version of petitioning, right? I mean, there's a certain amount of how these new media practices ape old media practices. But the, the group that I know best in this regard is a group called Witness out of New York, who are doing all kinds of interesting things about visualization of what they come to learn through internet and YouTube reporting around particular human rights problems. So there was like a transgender uh, project that they had going for a long period of time. I, I, we don't have time for me to go through the whole thing. But again, just really I thought thinking in very innovative ways about how did you capture information that could help people understand a problem and help visualize what that information meant in forms that for people who are more attuned to social media than I am. You may be more attuned, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not so much, right? But I think, again, for a younger generation of people, how you begin to present that kind of information in legible sorts of ways. I think the other side of that is also like the big data people but then there are these intermediaries that have emerged, again, around data visualization. So how do you take big data and put that in visual forms that you can put in front of people that move them to do one thing or another? 
what they do at that point still is in some ways an open question, I think. But it, it does suggest to me people thinking very creatively about taking those forms and doing new things with them. The other thing that Witness does that's really fabulous is they do these training courses all over the world for local actors about how to take video footage on a cell phone that can be used in a court of law. So in a sense, enabling people to have tools that they've got right on their phone, but to do it in ways that can't be challenged so much in court, right? So it's also about training a different kind of activist to use those tools in, in particular kinds of ways. Those seem to me some ways that begin to think in creative ways about, in a way, a world that's you know, changed so radically. I mean, the idea of people sitting around and writing letters is something that I feel increasingly like that we have to recover historically, rather than something that you know, is a practice that we understand as a daily one. Yeah. I mean, they weren't about actually writing them in the space. They were about getting them yeah. written. And that sort of presumed that someone was going to receive those letters and it would make a difference. And so there was a vector. And that's what I don't really I see a lot of talk, a lot of greed in our current period, a lot of talk and huge chatter. But the idea of impact, the idea of it's going to make a difference, there was Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I think that there have been some evidence of some kind of grassroots um, efforts, and, and the, certainly the Charlottesville, um, you know, the, the way that people have, have stood out, yeah. stood up and written, et cetera. But it's thinking through how that is rekindled. Yeah. No, no, no. It's a, I mean, it's a great question. I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate the, the thing about teaching people how to use video in a way that can be used um, legally. You know, that, that really does seem, I think that's huge, right? Because po that possibly can have an impact that the letters never could in certain ways, right? Um, but it's very delicate about how to make that work in a way that does actually work in a court of law. Um, so again, that would be the most particular thing that I can think of in terms of new practices that seems to have a certain amount of promise. Um, in thinking about immigration, you know, and your question, um, and I know people are need to slide out, so I'm gonna, we can talk more, but um, it, it, one of the things that it raised for me is sort of where is Vietnam in what's going on in the 1970s around human rights? And where is Vietnam also in thinking about um, a new politics of refugees, a new way of thinking about perhaps humanitarianism in the United States in that period of time. Um, and that is about like a different circulation of people, right? Because a war is over and the United States is basically lost and so is the South Vietnamese regime. And so you know, that sets in motion a, a whole variety of people who otherwise would not have left where they were. Um, on the humanitarian side, people have done, uh, humanitarian history side, people have done really, really, are starting to do really, really interesting work about how the kind of transnational circuits around Indochina's refugees are inflecting both humanitarian and refugee policy, not just in the United States, but in a variety of places, right? Because people are in Australia, and people are in Hong Kong, and people are, in fact, in some Latin American countries where they're able to have refugees as well. So there's been a kind of interest in thinking about that in a sort of more global kind of way and you know what are similarities and differences in, in, in what are happening, which I think is, is pretty interesting. I also think uh, like around humanitarianism, it, it's one of the arguments that I think is most interesting. This is Jana Lippmann who's at Tulane, who's working on a book that says that mm -hmm. Indochina refugees and humanitarian efforts around them gave the military a way out of a predicament at the end of Vietnam. Like, how do you rehabilitate yourself after Vietnam? Humanitar military humanitarianism is one of the ways in which you do it. And now, 
The military is called on over and over and over to operate in that kind of way. But what Jana argues is that the camps that people were coming to in the United States were military camps. This is happening right around the time period that you're thinking about with the Refugee Act, and that the military is self-consciously talking about those actions in the camps with refugees as a new form of humanitarian action that in a way repurposes what it is the military does and sort of tries to change again there. And she does it in this beautiful way because she does it with both high policy, so she's better than I am on the high policy thing, but she's also doing it from the ground that in fact people who are working in the camps are talking about this and not sure about, well, well, should they be working with these soldiers? Is it like unmanly to be doing humanitarian activities with refugees who come in? People really, you know, talking about this in like newspapers and magazines, newspapers that are on the ground um, in the camps. So again, that, that whole kind of moment, I think, post-Vietnam in, in multiple ways, around refugees, around human rights, around humanitarianism, is just a really sort of super interesting constellation of things. I'll be curious to see what the, the kind of coding that you do turns up with in the end. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, we need to, uh, to thank Mark for his erudition and his longevity because we're reaching the second hour of this talk. Um, so please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you. Mark. <laughs>